The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guard and keep you now and always, and especially today, as we remember our Lutheran women in mission. Today we have a joyful opportunity to celebrate. To celebrate women that God has given to us, but even more particularly, to celebrate one woman by the name of Ruth. Now Ruth doesn't get a lot of, uh, she doesn't get a lot of real estate in the Bible, does she? In fact, there's a book named for her, but it's only four chapters long. The only other time she shows up in the Bible is in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, which mentions her along with the other names of so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so begot so-and-so. And so we really don't see much of Ruth, but, and yet she's one of the most important women because she was included in that family line of Christ. She was included as the great-grandmother of King David, one of the most well-known kings of Israel. She was known for her faithfulness, for her loyalty. But it also, she is a Gentile. And so, it may give us pause for a moment when we realize that she is a Gentile because of the fact that she is part of the family line. Admittedly, she's 30 generations separated from, God, from, from Jesus' birth from, through Mary. But still, to have a Gentile in the family line? So, what makes her so special? Why should she be included among four women only three others besides herself, in that family line of Christ. Well, I'll tell you one reason. Well, one reason she's, she shouldn't be, it's her lineage. Like I said, she's a Gentile. But not just any Gentile. In fact, she's what's called a Moabite. Now, you may or may not recognize that name Moabite, but if you remember the story of Lot and his, and his daughters, and after they fled from Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot and, and well, his two daughters, they got their father drunk, and, and well, of course... Moabite, the Moabites came about from this ancestral relationship. Now, as close as they were, Lot was the nephew of Abraham. As close as they were to the, to the Israelites, they were not friends. In fact, they were enemies. Because when the people of Israel came into the land that God had promised to them, they were told not just to wipe out those you want to, but wipe out all the peoples. That includes the Moabites. Well, this reminds of us, of us another spot where the Moabites and the Israelites come into a bit of a tangle. And that is the king Balak. You may not know his name, but maybe you know the name Balaam. Balaam was a sorcerer with the talking donkey who Balak had intended to send to, go, to curse the people of Israel, who God used instead to bless the people of Israel. Even beyond that, the Moabite women seduced and led the people of Israel, the men of Israel, away from the true God to idols. So she's not special because of her lineage. Well, maybe there's another reason we could say she's special. Well, certainly not because she was any of any wealth or of any royal family. See, Ruth had married into the family of Elimelech. And when we look at Elimelech's family, we realize that they were not just poor, but they were destitute. And by the time Ruth and Naomi were going over back to Bethlehem, the house of bread, Kind of ironic that there was a famine in the house of bread. But as they were going back, they truly had nothing but the clothes on their back. Well, even before that, Elimelech had fled the land of Israel because of the fact that they had nothing. And see, this is a very significant thing. Because while we may look at it and say, well, people move all the time. For the people of Israel, this land had been appointed to them by God. It had been set aside. It had been reserved. And so by basically, by moving to the land of Moab, they had sold the land that God had given them, their inheritance, and had said, well, let's hope that maybe in Moab there'll be a little more rain. So there's no dowry to give. And while this was not a requirement of the wife's family, it was certainly an expectation, a customary thing that the wife's family, when she would get married, she would bring with her such things as slaves, cattle, even grain and other products of the trees. But again, Ruth had nothing to offer. It does mention that Boaz noticed her in the field, but as, it, as in many other places, it doesn't say that he noticed her by her great beauty. So again, we, we don't see anything special there. And even further, we don't see anything special in the sense that she, that at least from the outward appearance, that she would be favored by God. And let me put a disclaimer beforehand, although we have changed our view now. In those days, one of the signs of favor by God was that a woman would be able to not only bear one child, but to bear many children. Like I said, 
our view has changed, so don't throw anything. But this is something that the Israelites would use as a measurement of God's favor. So if you were an Israelite looking at Ruth, she had not borne any children. See, she would not have had to marry to, to find another husband in Boaz had she been able to bear children. And so many of the Israelites would have looked at her as finding disfavor in God's eyes. So again, we say, well, what made Ruth so special? My first instinct would be to say, well, nothing made her special. God was the one who made Ruth special. But that wouldn't be true, would it? Because we do see something different about Ruth than we see many other places in Scripture, even than we see in our world today. When we look at Ruth, we see a sense of devotion, a sense of loyalty, a sense of faithfulness. That is pretty uncommon, don't we? Now, we don't, uh, you don't necessarily see this, but when her and her sister-in-law were, were about to be left in, in the land of Moab by Naomi, Orpah, of course, turned back. She turned her neck, which is what her name actually means. But Ruth, despite all her family, her ancestry, the worship of her, the gods she knew, everything she had known, she turned her back so that she could go with Naomi. Even today, that devotion is pretty exemplary, isn't it? That faithfulness, that loyalty is pretty exemplary, isn't it? It's not something that we see in this day and age. Now, we do use the words that she said in our wedding ceremonies because we do emphasize what grace devotion this was. As Ruth said, don't urge me to leave you or turn, your back, from, or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my God. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God, my people. My God, where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. These words are often part of the wedding ceremony because of the fact we see such great devotion that we would hope that the husband shows to his wife, that the wife shows to her husband, that as they join together in that relationship, that that devotion may grow through the power of Christ. But very rarely do we see such a loyalty in this day and age, do we? Very rarely do we see such loyalty to the point of asking a curse. May God deal with me ever so severely. As we saw in Ruth's devotion to Naomi. In fact, polls show that more, often, more and more that loyalty is starting to be a sliding factor. Polls show that most people do not stay at a job for more than five years. Five years. In five years, many people will change from one company to the next. Now this is a change, in it, isn't it? Because we're used to, from generation to generation, 20 to 30 to years staying at one company. But in recent times, polls have shown people only five years moving on to the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Sometimes by employment and unemployment. Sometimes for what is better or what is different. But not only that, we see that in our community. Well, not our community, actually. But many communities around the United States, we see people moving in and out all the time. There's no sense of loyalty to the community that, that, that folks grew up in. Like I said, our community would be an exception to this rule, wouldn't it? Because many times people do leave and come back. But across, around our country, communities are changing constantly. And we see this in the church as well. Many times people who for generations have been loyal to one church body or another have kind of dropped that loyalty, haven't they? For different things, whether it's for a better preacher, for more exciting hymns, for different readings that are more inspirational. People will move from, maybe they were always in the Lutheran church, their mother and their grandmother and their great-grandmother, and may move on to another church. But it's not just the Lutheran church this is happening, but Baptist church, Pentecostal church. I mean, just go across the boards. Loyalty is something we've seen wane. So it's a pretty exemplary when we see such great devotion and loyalty. Now, most of these thoughts, it's not so important. But we've also seen it wane in the relationship between sons and daughters, mothers and fathers, between grandchildren and their grandparents, even between husband and between wife. We've seen these loyalty, this loyalty break down. Children and grandchildren who maybe are unable to talk to their parents, sometimes though refusing to talk to their parents or grandparents. In the marriage, in marriage these days, it's more common to ask, which marriage are you on? 
rather than is this your first marriage? Have you been married just once? And so we see that those words of, of, of Ruth really stand out for us. Now probably the most significant place and most scary place that we've seen loyalty shudder and shake, struggle with, is in not just a church, the church building, but in the church, the relationship with God. Now many of you, of course, are here this morning because of your relationship with God. You know that God is with you, that God is there for you, that God has been with you through all that you go through. But there are many people who they go to church and they don't find the strength they need. They don't find God. And so their loyalty starts to wane. Instead of seeing the church as a place that is an earthly institution where people, sinners, are, are they start to put that blame of their problems there are issues with the church on God himself. And so their loyalty starts to wane because they start to hear verses like, I will never leave you or forsake you, Deuteronomy 31, chapter 6. And they say, well, that's not for me. That's not how it feels in my life. They look at that and they say, that's for those good Christians. That's for those people who are there every Sunday. And their disloyalty starts to grow. And they struggle because they feel like... It's not them being disloyal. They feel as though it's not their first step, but it's God who has turned their back on, his back on them. One of my favorite poems is Footprints in the Sand. And the author asks the question, Why, when I have needed you most, have you not been there for me? As you may know from the poem, as the author looked back, he saw that there was only one set of footprints in the sand. As he looked back, he saw that those one set of footprints were in the toughest times of his life. We know how the answer ends up, is that the Lord was carrying him. But we know that the question that was asked there was one that many people may not word it that way, but have asked. Lord, why were you disloyal to me in those hardest times of my life? It may surprise you, but many people believe that this poem came from a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, written in 1880. And if you may not know Charles Spurgeon, because you're in the Lutheran Church, but Charles Spurgeon was a Christian preacher who wrote, I mean, hundreds of sermons that are well known to this day. And so even, the point is, even Christian pastors, even the people appointed by God to lead the people at, at times, will feel that God... Feel that distance from God. And perhaps some of you have felt this way. Maybe not right now. But maybe some point in your life you felt as though God had kind of left you hung out to dry. That you felt as though you had been loyal to Him. You had been in church on every Sunday. You would sung the hymns even if it was difficult. You listened to the preacher ramble on. You read his, the scripture. You prayed the prayers. You tried to live a good, upstanding life, but you felt as though, as though you were alone. Loneliness is a hard thing to deal with, isn't it? Especially when we feel like we're left alone by God. And so it's not so hard for us to see how those people who have left the church, our children, our grandchildren, people we love and care about have left the church, when they feel as though they have, that God is not there. Now it would be easy for me to say, we all know that he is with us. But see, I can't convince you of that. I can't be the one who stands here and says, no, the Lord has not left your side. The Lord has walked alongside every step of the way. Because only he can do that. Only He can send His Spirit to speak to your heart. As we looked at that reading from John today, we saw, we saw that promise of the faithful of our faithful Lord, that He would not leave us alone. But it is only by His power that you will know that. It is only by His work on your heart that you can know that true promise. That you can know that He will never leave you nor forsake you. And that promise is not an empty promise. One that you think is made by just a cheap promise. 
But that is promise that's backed up by one who has been faithful even unto death. That promise is one that was made that even before we knew how much we needed, that our Lord knew we needed Him. And again, we go back to the faithfulness of Ruth. And we know that even as faithful as she was to Naomi, it was not by her power, by her, by her will, but it was by Boaz, coming, God working through Boaz to be her kinsman redeemer. Now this is one, a word that we don't always use today, is it? It's kinsman redeemer is one that you may have heard tossed around the church, but we don't generally use it because well, we don't have many kinsmen redeemers. But Boaz functioned as Ruth's kinsman redeemer in the sense that he provided her, for her an inheritance when no one else would or could. He gave of his very own inheritance so that they would have inheritance. And that is exactly what God does for us, for his people. He gave of his very own inheritance so that we would have an inheritance with him in heaven. And he paid for that inheritance not by gold and silver, but by his very precious body and blood. His loyalty, see, was so much stronger than ours ever could be. His loyalty of, to us was perfect. His love and compassion did not fail. His love and compassion is one that is everlasting, as he promises us in Jeremiah. His love and compassion is one that is guaranteed for us as young as we are or as old as we are. His love and compassion is one that He has given to us each and every day as He walks alongside us, as He has given His Spirit to us. His love and compassion is one we see refreshed each Sunday morning as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. His love and compassion is one that we see renewed when He calls us home to Him. Ruth was special. She was special because she knew, because she was loyal. And she was special because she trusted in God. Not just some random God as the, as the Moabites would, but she trusted in the one true God. And that is our God, who provided for her. Now the author of Hebrews encourages us. He encourages us to hold on to this trust. Hold on to this trust as we weather the storms of life. Right near the end of our reading for today. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I love that word unswervingly. Let us hold unswervingly to this promise. Let us trust without going to the left or to the right. Let us know for sure that our God is with us, that our God is stronger and greater than anything that can happen to this, in this world, that our God is the one who would move mountains and give his very own life for each of us. See, that is, that is the beautiful truth that we see lived out in Ruth's life, that we see in her faithfulness. And that is a promise that you know, that you know because you've heard it preached to you, but more importantly, you know because God has spoken into your heart and told you that promise. Now, we don't end here, though, because that promise wasn't saved only for us, was it? That promise wasn't only reserved for those people who were part of the Israelite community. But let's go back again to that genealogy. Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Did you realize, as I said, I guess I did tell you this before, is four women in that genealogy. At least for certain, three of those four women were Gentiles. See, God has opened up this promise not only for those good Christian people, those people who look and act like Christians, but He has opened up this promise for all people. He has opened up this promise for all those who are in need. He has opened this promise for the Gentiles, those who are outside the church. And He has given us the opportunity, to know the privilege, to give that promise to others. Many of you know people who have left our church, who have left the church, who have turned from God and turned from their relationship with Him. And it's our encouragement from God to love them as He does. Because He hasn't stopped loving them because they, they left the church. No, He keeps reaching for them and He invites us to go alongside, to reach out for those, to remind them of the good news of the Gospel, 
to remind them that God's word is not just empty promises, but is a promise backed up by his own body and blood. And so our encouragement from Ruth is to remain loyal, to remain loyal in our families, to remain loyal in our our workplace, to remain loyal in our church and remain loyal to our God. But ultimately, to remember our God is faithful even when we are not. And to share with others, our God, who is so faithful, has given his very own body and blood so that we, so that we one day would be called home to be with him forever, to celebrate the inheritance that he has won for us. Amen. We pray. Lord most holy, we thank you that you have been loyal to us, that you have been faithful to us, that you have proven your faithfulness even beyond a question, beyond a measure of a doubt, that by sending your son Jesus, you have shown us your heart. You have shown us your love and you have shown us your mercy. But even beyond that, Lord, you have blessed our lives with the sending of your Holy Spirit so that each day we may know for certain you are with us. That as we look back on the times of our lives that look as though we walked alone, that we may know that you carried us, that you picked us up off the ground when we were too weak to go a step further, that you stepped forward for us and carried us through. We thank you, Lord, that you have not done this with cheap grace, but you have done so by your payment, that you have given your own life that we may inherit eternal life. May this be the strength of our hearts. May it be the encouragement of our minds. And it may, be, may it be the love that we share to the very ends of the earth. Lord Jesus, in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen.